Hey, good evening. It's good to see a great crowd tonight. Um, I'm kind of like the opening act, but don't worry, you don't have to sit through a full set. I'm just going to do a little quick tune here and introduce our guest tonight. Uh, just two housekeeping type things. Um, I was told to remind you to go ahead and fill out these evaluations that are in your program when you get a chance, um, just to help in planning and programming Abbott in the future. And then, of course, you remember to submit your comments because we'll have the Q&A later, and I'll pick out the toughest questions and try to stump Michael as best I can. So, um, Well, uh, he said, uh, Michael said tonight that you can say whatever you want, he can take it, and so that's on him. I'm going to do my best job at giving a concise introduction here. Um, if, if you're not familiar, he's um, a New York Times bestselling author, a humorist, a radio show host, a musician. Um, he also refers to himself as an amateur pig farmer and an active member of his local rescue service um, in Wisconsin, in rural Wisconsin. He's written for a slug of magazines, Men's Health, Esquire, on down the line. Um, he lives on a private drive in rural Wisconsin, I was going to say, and that's, that factors into one of his latest books. Um, he's written the most uh, recent book, Visiting Tom, A Man, A Highway, and the Road to Roughneck Grace, in which 82-year-old uh, Tom Hartwig is a central character. And... Um, he describes beautifully Tom's uh, shop on his, uh, on his farm with the interstate humming nearby. Um, this is a man who knows how to swing a sigh, uh, but he doesn't call himself a farmer. He was raised by farmers and loggers, but he's adamant that he's not a farmer. Um, uh, I like this quote. He talks about how his father taught him uh, how to sling manure, and a childhood spent slinging manure is the metaphorical basis for a writing career. So, <laughs> uh, you know. As a newspaper journalist, I'll concur. Um, some, of his other, some of his other books, uh, Truck, A Love Story, Off Main Street, Barnstormer's Prophets, and uh, Gate Mouse Gator, um, and of course, Population 485. Um, he's also the leader of Michael Perry and the Long Beds. He has a couple albums under his belt, and there's another one on the way. Um, he's found online at sneezingcow.com or on Twitter, at Sneezing Cow. You can ask him about Sneezing Cow. Uh, he has a few humor albums out there as well, not just the music. Um, he's a neighbor to Bonnie Vare, if there are any indie music fans out there. Um, and he's a fellow Waylon Jennings and Greg Brown fan, too. Um, and one of his uh, upcoming works, too, he was just telling me, is a roughneck take on French philosophy, so I expect to hear more about that. <laughs> All right, well, give a warm welcome, Des Moines, to Michael Perry. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to start off tonight with a story I've told a lot of times, uh, but I like to start with it, especially when I'm a long ways from home, uh, because it helps center me and it also speaks to, to, where, to where I come from. Um, a few years back, I wrote a book called Population 485. And the book Population 485, it's just that old Can You Go Home Again book. It's been written many times by many people. In my case, I wrote about going back home to my hometown of New Auburn, Wisconsin, population 485, uh, after 12 years away. And the way that I found myself, uh, found my way back into the community was by joining the local volunteer fire department. And the reason for joining the volunteer fire department were numerous. Uh, number one, um, I don't, belong to any of the local churches, and I don't go to the tavern, and I don't play softball, and I can't bowl, <laughs> and I don't know how to polka. So <laughs> there's really nothing left but the fire department. <laughs> and plus my two brothers and my mom were already on, so <laughs> I didn't want to be the only one without any stories to tell at Sunday dinner. So I joined uh, the volunteer fire department and uh, also the ambulance service as an EMT. And without intending to, that is how I rediscovered my hometown after a 12-year absence, one call at a time, fires and car wrecks and medical and trauma calls. Um, and so I wrote about that in Population 45. The book has been out now for just over a decade. And over that time, I've received scores of emails and letters from people saying, we read your book about life in the small town. 
we loved it. We loved it so much that we've sold everything and we're moving to a small town. <laughs> and I'll say, well, hang on there, Spanky. <laughs> Because small towns can be difficult places. They have long memories. You can be 50 years old trying to live down something that happened when you was 15 uh, in the gravel pit. <laughs> and even I, although I was returning of my own free will, I was eager to go back to New Auburn. And, and in the end, I had 12 wonderful years back there. But even I had a certain amount of trepidation about making the move. And the reason for that was, I'd been away for 12 years. When I came back, I wasn't the same guy when I returned to my hometown as I was when I left. What I like to say is that when I left New Auburn, I was a farm boy, a good student, and a fair defensive end. I returned 12 years later a long-haired writer with soft hands and a nursing degree. <laughs> so there's a certain amount of street cred to recover with some of my buddies in the coon hunting crowd. <laughs> now, I've, I've had to update the anecdote uh, specifically as it pertains to the long hair. Uh, <laughs> for years, I had long hair, waist length. There are two reasons I no longer have long hair, and the first, sadly, is just generalized crop failure. <laughs> Just got to the point where there was no point. <laughs> and the other reason is that um, I, I, it, it had started to get real thin on top, but was still very long in back. And I thought, you know, I really ought to cut it off. I'm kind of headed for the Ben Franklin look. <laughs> but I hadn't made the move yet. And then one spring, we got paged out to fight a grass fire on the railroad tracks outside of town. And I was right up in the teeth of the flames, knocking it down, fighting from the black, as any well-trained wildland firefighter will tell you that you must. But I was right up in there, and all of a sudden, one of the other firefighters ran up and started patting me. Now, normally, you don't get a lot of that. <laughs> so I said, what are you doing? And he said, man, your hair's on fire. <laughs> And indeed, it, it was crackling right along. So <laughs> at that point, I thought, you know, if it ain't falling out, it's bursting into flames and <laughs> just going to cut it off. So, and then, as I mentioned, I also had to overcome the stigma of being a male nurse. Now, I was raised on a small dairy farm, grew up milking cows, cleaning calf pens, making hay. Then at the age of 16, I started working summers on a ranch in Wyoming, a regular working beef and hay ranch, a road roundup, did branding and everything. And I worked out there for five years, so I worked into my college years. And, and what I would do is I'd work all summer as a cowboy, and then I'd come back uh, to college, and I'd use my cowboy wages to pay for my tuition. I, I'm here to tell you, I, I, and I was going to nursing school, I was the only cowboy in all of Wyoming who was putting himself through nursing school. <laughs> I based this on several conversations I had <laughs> around the old Brandon fire. I was what they call a header, which meant they'd rope the calf and bring it in, and I'd meet the horse and grab the rope, and I'd slide down the rope till I came in contact with the calf, and I'd throw the calf and hold it while they branded it and did all the things they'd do. So I'd be down there on the ground holding the calf, and some crusty old cowboy would walk up behind me with a red-hot branding iron, and he'd say, where are you from, son? Wisconsin. <laughs> what do you do? I'm going to college. <laughs> what for? I want to be a nurse. <laughs> It'd get really quiet out there on the prairie. <laughs> and I'll never forget the night I told my dad I wanted to be a nurse. I really wasn't too worried. My father is a very gentle man, a hard-working farmer. But nonetheless, you're a 17-year-old guy. You're, a, you're the leading tackler on the New Auburn Trojans football team. And tonight's the night you decide you're going to tell dad you want to be a nurse. It's a moment. So we was walking out to the barn after supper to milk the cows. And I was about five paces behind him. And I said, dad, I want to be a nurse. And he stopped. And he turned. And he looked at me. And he said, well, your mother's a nurse. 
It's a noble profession. I think you'll make a fine nurse. And he began to walk to the barn. Then he stopped and he turned back and he said, there is just one thing. And I said, what's that? He said, I just want to be there when they pin that little white cap on you. (laughs) So I moved back to New Auburn and basically what I'm doing during my first year there is I'm just looking for signs to tell me whether or not I've made the right decision. And the biggest event of the year in New Auburn, population 485, is Jamboree Days. And Jamboree Days consists basically of a five minute parade, three minutes of which consists of fire trucks. (laughs) That's why you join the department right there, so you can drive a tanker truck in the parade and throw zag nuts at the kids. (laughs) So you got your five minute parade, and then you got your softball tournament. And a softball tournament serves as a fundraiser for the local park. So we're, uh, as members of the volunteer fire department, we're expected to pitch in and help run the softball tournament fundraiser. Now, in addition to the softball tournament, directly adjacent to the softball field is a beer tent. Truth be told, that's where the majority of your fundraising occurs, right there. And we run the beer tent as well. So New Auburn has only one softball field and no lights on the softball field. And over the years, this tournament has become very popular. So in order to get all the teams through the brackets, they have to start playing softball at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning. They play all day long until dark. They resume play at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning and play all day long until the tournament has been resolved. So a little while after I moved back, I get assigned the duty of going down to the park on Sunday morning at Jamboree Days with one of the old timers on the department to clean up the beer tent, get it ready for the day. So we get down to the park, it's 8.30 a.m. on Sunday morning, the first softball game of the day is already underway. We're in the beer tent picking up paper plates and plastic cups and napkins, and this guy wanders into the beer tent off the street. Not a softball player, just a civilian. And he says, can I get a beer? And I looked at my partner and I said, well, it is 8.30 a.m. on Sunday morning, (laughs) but you've been on the department longer, you make the command decision. And he says, well, guess there's no law against it. So he goes around behind the bar and he draws the guy a beer and he sets it down and the guy hands his money over and he puts both elbows on the plywood and he raises the beer to his lips and he's just about to take a pull at the foam when he hears the crack of the bat on the softball field adjacent and he freezes. And then he looks. Then he brings his lips back in line with the beer which has not moved and says, A little early in the morning for softball. (laughs) And it was at that point that I said, yes, I am back among my people. So So after the book Population 485 came out, uh, I wrote a book called Truck a love story. And I get asked in interviews all the time, is that a love story about a truck or about a woman? And I always respond with a question of my own. Is there not room enough in a man's heart for both? (laughs) Your answers will vary. And indeed, part of the book is about the resurrection of of my old pickup truck, in particular a 1951 L123 quarter ton long bed international harvester pickup truck. (laughs) I love that truck. I bought it uh, in college off of some guy hauling firewood. I paid him 125 bucks for it. It was my only vehicle for three years. And as I said, I I just loved it. And there there was only one thing I didn't like about that old truck, and and that was that being a Being a three-quarter ton international, it rode like a tank, very stiff suspension, especially if you never had a load in it. And, you know, I was going to nursing school. So, you know, occasionally had a pair of white shoes back there, but that's pretty much it. And so you take that really stiff suspension and you combine it with the fact that all those old internationals had a real springy bench seat in the front. 
And so every time you'd hit a bump with that stiff suspension, that springy bench seat would just fling you up into the, into the roof of the cab. And so at one, one Sunday morning, on a whim, having tired of the repetitive neck injuries, I decided to go drive from the city where I was going to college, drive up north to my dad's farm, and put uh, bucket seats in my old international. So I took off from the city, stopped at a junkyard along the way, tore two bucket seats out of a Ford Maverick, threw them in the back of the truck, went to my dad's farm, drove out there by the shop, and, and then I, um, I pulled that, bu that bench seat out, and then I drilled four holes on the floor of the cab, and I took one of the bucket seats, and I bolted it down to the floor, and then I climbed up in there, and I sat down, and of course, <laughs> Couldn't actually see out, so, so I unbolted the seat and took it out again, and, and then I went around behind the shop to Dad's iron rack, and I got some angle iron, some strap iron, and a little channel iron. I got the cutting torch, and I got the welder, and I cobbled up this great big steel frame that probably weighed more than the seat itself, and I bolted that to the floor, and then I bolted the bucket seat to the frame, and then when I sat down, I was good to go. I could see just fine. The problem was, as with many poorly planned male projects, I was out of daylight, and I had to be in class in the city the next morning, so I drove back to the city. And so for the next three months, um, I just uh, had a big steel-floored empty cavern over there on the right, and I was dating the sweetest little farm girl from Hillsdale, Wisconsin at the time, and I didn't want to be an insensitive cad, so I put a, a yellow beanbag chair over there. <laughs> I thought it was pretty snazzy. Um, <laughs> she eventually did marry a guy named Mike. <laughs> uh, one of the problems I had in writing the book Truck, is, and this is hard for me to admit because I really am a, I'm a roughneck guy. I grew up on a farm and my brothers log and have heavy equipment and my dad farms and logs. and. Um, and so I, I like to work, and I know how to work, and I like to get right in there, uh, but my mechanical aptitude is almost nothing. I mean, I can do the basics. I can change out a spun bearing. I can run a gas hatchet. I can do a little bubblegum welding. But once, once you pop the hood, I'm in over my head. And although, because of how I was raised, I know how to act when you pop the hood, <laughs> which, which is really half the battle. Uh, you know, so you pop the hood on that old 51 International, and then you got to lean in there. And you scratch and spit a little bit. And then at some point, you, you straighten up and you back away and you utter what is my all-time favorite guys looking at engines under hoods line, which is you go, yeah, looks like we're going to have to pull her. <laughs> I got no idea what you do with her. <laughs> Once you pull her. But I know you got a puller, so. so in order to get the book written and get the truck fixed, I had to find someone to help me, so I recruited my brother-in-law, Mark, and my brother-in-law, Mark, then became a central character in the book, Truck. And my brother-in-law, Mark, he's one of these guys that, of a, of a weekend, he likes to watch him a little NASCAR uh, while drinking a Bush beer and sitting in his recliner, which has been reupholstered in genuine tree bark camouflage fabric. <laughs> But he's also an extremely talented machinist, and he spends his days designing and fabricating things the rest of us sit on and pull on every day without giving it a second thought. And he's uh, very good at body work, and he's a super mechanic, and so he was uh, just the right guy for the job. And most importantly, as I wrote in the book, uh, he is a, a good husband to my sister, and she, frankly, is no walk in the park. So <laughs> we... We as a family are grateful to him. <laughs> we don't know why he does it, but he does, so. Um, it is also a love story. I was a bachelor for 39 years. There's a lot of reasons for that, but we don't have enough time tonight. Um, but, I, and this book was never supposed to be about anything other than fixing up my old truck and a couple other things, but what happened is, in, literally in real time, while I was writing the book, I went to the library and I met a woman. 
Now, I've notified the American Library Association and told them they're free to use that quote in all their promotional materials. <laughs> So far, nothing, but <laughs> they're really missing the boat. But anyway, I, I met this woman, and, um, and uh, I don't want to give away the end of the book, but, you know, it's on my left hand here. And, uh, so I, it wound up being a, a book about going from being a long-time bachelor to actually getting married. And um, when I met my now wife, I knew almost instantly that, that it was different than anything I'd ever been involved in, and, and about three, four weeks into it, we went for a long drive and we were coming along the south coast of Lake Superior and we pulled over and we stopped and, and I took her hand in mine and I looked her right in the eye and just said, you know, I, I've never felt like this. I've had so many failures and, and yet I'm utterly at peace with the idea of committing myself to you for the rest of my life. And she looked me in the eye and said, yeah, well, I'm going to see how things are going at the six month mark. <laughs> And as I wrote in the book, well, that was a rolled up newspaper to the snoot. <laughs> but that pretty much sums up my wife. <laughs> She's 10 years younger than I am, but she is the grown up in our relationship. <laughs> she keeps a little manila folder labeled reality. And every once in a while, she lets me have a peek in there. <laughs> the other thing that the book Truck was about that is not immediately obvious is it is a gardening book. Uh, the reason I wanted to write a gardening book is because I had had it up to here with happy gardening books. <laughs> I felt it was time for a grim gardening book, and I'm the guy to write it. So uh, it's basically just set up so that each chapter represents a month in the year of my garden. And so I'd like to share with you now a little excerpt um, from the chapter that represents my very favorite gardening month of the year, January. <laughs> you know, because that's when the seed catalogs come, you know, hopes are high <laughs> and reality has yet to intrude. In part to mitigate the barren state of the earth, I've decided to order seeds for my garden. I possess the perfect armchair for the task, a saggy old green thing that came from my grandmother's basement and now sits on a rug beside my homemade bookshelves. Sinking into the worn cushions, I spend the remainder of the afternoon leafing through seed catalogs and recharging my chamomile tea. It is as if a sun lamp has been turned toward my soul. My winter-bound spirit thaws, releasing sense memories, the shink-shink sound of a hoe cleaving sandy soil, the press of a hard seed between the pad of thumb and forefinger, the scratchy hiss of squash leaves moving in a warm breeze. Seed catalogs are responsible for more unfulfilled fantasies than Enron and Playboy combined. <laughs> Blissful though it is, the annual seed catalog review adds up to a perennial tradition of willful delusion. It begins responsibly enough, scientific approach and rigorous intent, as for example in the selection of beets. Notepad at hand, I calculate the harvest date of 53-day red aces as opposed to 60-day cylindras, factor in the hybrid vigor of the red ace, take into account the sliceability of the cylindra, cross-reference all results with the applicable hardiness zone, jot my selection in neat pre-ruled columns, including item name, associated catalog number, and miscellaneous starred comments, and then move briskly on to a hard-eyed evaluation of kale. I am in essence a minor god with plans for my few square feet of the earth. I shall sow and I shall reap. I am a catalyst in the cycle of life. I'm also distracted by all the pretty pictures. 
The seed catalog is printed on paper of the same texture as your gaudier supermarket tabloids, a stock perfectly suited for oversaturated photos of royal burgundy purple pod bush beans, overfluffed sheaves of Savoy spinach, and lurid tomato shots, with every fruity globe so taut and flawless it might have been snatched from the chest of a prefab starlet. Carrots are arranged in arresting bolts of orange. A neon splay of bright light Swiss chard vibrates like a beer sign in a health food store. <laughs> Purpling stems of beet green plunge into the dusty lavender crown of the stout root, sliced open in one photograph to reveal a glistening fine-grained core the color of deoxygenated blood. The play of sun and shadow on a grape-like cluster of sweet millions miniature tomatoes is so mustily conveyed that your parotids clench at the thought of the skin popping under the pressure of your molars and the subsequent sweet gush of pulp. A pair of bellboy peppers reflect the light with a blue tinge that suggests the exact feel of the cool green lobes against your palm, and I am drawn straight into summer. It is as if the catalog ink is spiked with chlorophyll. Rigorous intent begins to fray. Never shop for groceries on an empty stomach, they say. Corollary riff. Never order seeds when the world is frozen stiff. <laughs> and then I talk about how scientific process vaporizes the minute I hit the cucumber section. So here's my beef with the cucumber section. All I want is a cucumber. They got 13 variations of cucumbers, and I get all locked up and panicky at the overabundance of opportunity. And they got the, uh, the Sweet Slice Hybrid, the Fanfare, the Ashley, the Market Moor, the Cool Breeze, the County Fair Hybrid, the Orient Express, and the Sweet Success, the Diva. And so they have all these, these different kinds, and as I said, I always order way more than I need. And then my single greatest complaint about the cucumber section is as follows. The seed catalogs promote several varieties of burpless cucumbers. I have yet to find one promoted as burpish. <laughs> this is flatly a missed marketing opportunity. Among my rural and roughneck acquaintances are no small number of folks who not only savor the art of eructation, they cultivate it. <laughs> there are guys on the fire department with a three octave range. <laughs> I have seen a woman throw her head back beneath the Jamboree Day's beer tent and let loose a burp so resonant, polka dancers were moved to applause. <laughs> Thanks. Um, after I wrote Truck, then I, I wrote a book called Coop, or as the very first person to ever interview me live on the radio about the book called it Co-op. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. Probably shoulda. Um, but Coop is really uh, about grow, uh, my wife and I move into a small farm and trying to raise some of our own food. And um, it also is a book where I look back at being raised on the farm by, by my father and my mom, and we had a, quite an unusual family. And it opens with a scene from my childhood about being a farmer's kid. At the earliest, state edge, at the earliest edges of my memory, my father is plowing, and I'm running behind him. I see my feet going pat, pat, pat over the soil. I see my father, left hand on the wheel, right forearm braced against the fender, head turning back to check the depth of the plow, then forward to gauge his progress. The soil is red and sandy in the high spots, and dark and loamy in the low spots, where it curls from the plowshares like strips of licorice, leaving me this square, shin-deep trough in which to travel. I trail the sound of the little tractor, so close to ground I can hear the soft plop of the overturned clods. Now and then the plow slices the soil so cleanly that a chubby white grub drops into the furrow unscathed. The grubs are translucent white, their black guts dimly visible as if through rice paper. 
Grackles and cowbirds flock the plow, pecking through the new turned dirt. The grub will not last long. There is my father on his underpowered Ford Ferguson, and there is me trotting right behind him, and there is God above, looking down as I run the straight groove of the furrow, my life laid out on a line drawn in the earth. So I write about um, growing up on the farm and, uh, and my parents, I was, raised, I was raised in an obscure fundamentalist Christian sect. And I, I love to say that because it makes people uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, they think I was raised within a walled compound where we hoarded diesel fuel and fertilizer. We did hoard diesel fuel and fertilizer, but we used it to plant corn. Um, and in truth, it was a very gentle existence. Uh, I am no longer part of that faith. I left a long time ago. My parents are still part of it. And although I no longer believe as they believe, I try every day to be more like them. They are humble and they are charitable. And uh, so it's been, uh, it, it's what I draw from, even as a guy who nowadays describes himself as a bumbling agnostic with traces of amateur existentialism. Um, or to put it another way, I ain't looking for a fight, I'm just looking. Um, so I write about that upbringing, and also uh, my parents have taken in scores and scores of children over the years, uh, many of them uh, severely uh, physically and, and mentally disadvantaged, and I write about what that was like. But I also write about my own little family, because uh, when, when I got married, my wife had a, had a three-year-old daughter when I met her, um, and, and she lives with us uh, full-time. And I write about her father, her father has since married and, and has two sons and lives in Colorado. So my older daughter has uh, two brothers in Colorado. I've never cared for the term stepdaughter. I don't find it offensive or troubling. I just, what I've always said is that I think it does a fine job of conveying the situation, but it is utterly insufficient in conveying the heart. And a roughneck Vietnam vet poet friend of mine gave me the beautiful gift of a wonderful word the day he said, she's not your stepdaughter, she's your given daughter. And I love that word and, and I love that girl. Um, I write in, in the book Coop about the relationship between her father and I. And it's, uh, I suppose, from the outside somewhat unusual. I'm grateful to say that the four grown-ups have uh, worked it out. And he and I are in regular communication because although uh, she lives with us, uh, he and I are charged with uh, doing our best to raise her. And we communicate regularly. Um, he is... Uh, there's really only one issue between the two of us that is, uh, causes any real discomfort for me, and that is that uh, he's the shortest of three brothers, and um, he's six foot seven. <laughs> and so my given daughter, who is now 13, is two inches taller than I. Uh, <laughs> We saw it coming. But the discomfort is not so much, uh, the, 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 one, the, the only issue between us that's difficult is that he's a hugger. I'm not so much a hugger, okay? I'll take one for the team. Uh, but the problem is him being 6'7", when I do consent to hug him, it's... it's just a little odd. Um, but my favorite story that really, I think, in a nutshell, explains the relationship in a way I never could is that um, when we moved to this farm, and we moved into an old, I write in the book, Coop, about the old Slantways farmhouse we moved into, which is, it's very isolated. It's the end of, end of a dead-end road. And uh, it, it, it was, the farmhouse originated as a log cabin built in the 1880s. And that part is wonderful, because in the living room, you can still see the exposed hand-hewn logs. And they're square, and they're as broad as, the, as a boar's back. And they lend a great solidity to the center of the house. Unfortunately, since the 1880s, there have been a number of additions and remodels conducted by people you wouldn't necessarily refer to as carpenters. <laughs> uh, more likely, just farmers with hammers. And 
it shows because there's just a, like windows that don't match and places where you have to duck. And the best way to explain the nature of our house is that if you're standing in our kitchen and you want to go into the living room, you have to step up this little four inch riser. Then you're in the living room. You walk past the wood stove, around the center of the house, up the hallway, into the kitchen, and find yourself back at the little four inch riser, having never gone down a four inch riser. <laughs> So it's a little bit like living in one of them M.C. Escher drawings. You know, you just, <laughs> just keep going up that magic staircase and nothing ever happens, man. Like... But anyway, we moved to this very isolated slantways farmhouse in the dead of winter, and my wife was pregnant with what would become our second daughter, and we're standing in the middle of that old living room in that old house, and, and, and the wind is blowing and the snow is stacking up, and we're in the middle of nowhere, and my wife looks at me and she says, I want to have this baby in this house. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> and then her gaze hardened, and I realized I really didn't have a vote. And indeed, then I write about that process, and we did wind up uh, uh, having our second daughter born upstairs in that old farmhouse. And um, there's a lot to say about that, and I say it in the book, but uh, the big day came, and of course, um, we had kept our Colorado family, as we call them, updated throughout the process. And this is the story that I just think speaks to what we've worked out. So the big day comes, the baby is born safely, she's in her mother's arms, and my given daughter says, can I call my dad and let him know? I said, absolutely, give him the great news, tell him we have a new sister. She goes pelting down the stairs. I hear her pick up the phone, I hear her dial. I can hear him answer. And with absolutely no other introduction, she says, well, you're a dad again. <laughs> well, kind of. So it's my understanding that uh, I, I need to s sort of wrap up now, and then we'll, we'll move on to the, the Q&A session. So I'm going to close with, I think we'll, the new book, Visiting Tom, I'd love to talk about it a little bit and tell a couple stories out of that, but perhaps we'll touch on it in the Q&A. So I'm going to close with uh, a piece. It's, it, it was an essay that was part of a collection called Off Main Street, and I really resisted putting this essay in this collection. I actually have emails to prove that I fought my editor on it. I didn't want it in there. I didn't think it would be of any interest. And furthermore, it is a deeply uh, personal piece. And as a matter of fact, I hesitated for a long, long time uh, uh, before ever reading it in public because of the personal nature. But then I did my research and I figured out that no matter where I read this piece, no matter the geographic location, no matter the demographic makeup of the audience, 10% uh, of the audience is completely down with me. And I ain't gonna lie to you, 10 percent's good enough for me. So, <laughs> so I would like to share with you uh, some excerpts uh, from an essay that I wrote about my first ever kidney stone. <laughs> See, that's my 10% right there. <laughs> this is for you. The stone struck on a Tuesday evening, somewhere along I-94, just east of Minneapolis. First came an upper abdominal twinge, similar to gas pains at dawn, of the sort precipitated by excess bratwurst at bedtime. That doesn't get a very big laugh outside of Wisconsin, but... <laughs> you... Except that no amount of twisting or turning would break it loose. Then it seemed as if my right kidney had been run through with a superheated knitting needle. I was veering in and out of my lane, gasping like a scuppered carp. Struck by this delusion that a hot bath would dissipate the pain, I careened to a motel. I'm certain the desk clerk pegged me for a meth head. I was pallid, shivering and rolling in sweat as she ran my credit card, but she worked quickly. I staggered to the room, filled the tub full blast, and stripped out of my clothes. 
By now, based on my experience as a nurse and an EMT, I had pretty much self-diagnosed. One in 10 Americans will experience the joy of kidney stones, and the pain I felt was my secret handshake into the club. I dropped into the steaming water and, drawing on my knowledge of anatomy, physics, and desperation, assumed a bizarre position calculated to roll the stone back into the kidney. After about 15 seconds of lying in scalding water with my butt hoisted above the plimsoll mark, I ran up the white flag and dialed 911. So the first person to come busting through the door was a cop paramedic. He, this was in Woodbury, Minnesota, and, and he had on his law enforcement uh, uniform and he had a sidearm, but he had his paramedic bag over his shoulder. So he stops at the foot of the bed and he sees me lying on top of the bed and I'm exhibiting the three classic signs of a kidney stone. I'm sweating profusely, writhing uncontrollably. And this is a hallmark sign because with a lot of abdominal pain, you engage in what's called guarding. You hold very, very still. You don't want anyone to touch you or move you. But with a kidney stone, it's a smooth muscle contraction issue. And so you're just constantly squirming, trying to escape it, and you can't. And the third classic sign I was exhibiting is, I was cussing like a sailor. <laughs> And I'm not proud of that. Uh, I was not raised that way. But a kidney stone vaporizes your moral ethical fiber. <laughs> and I was using all the important words. So this cop paramedic looks at me there, sweating, writhing, and cursing. And he says, <laughs> I'll bet you got a kidney stone. <laughs> And I said, do you reckon, Sparky? <laughs> and then he said, would you like some morphine? And I said, yes, I would. <laughs> so. so they gave me some morphine, and then the rest of the crew came, and they loaded me on the cot, and they hauled me off to the hospital. It was the first time in 18 years of working EMS that I'd ever ridden in the back of the rig, lying down, looking up. Got to the hospital, they put me through a CT scan. A little while later, the ER doc shows up at my bedside, and he says, well, as you suspected and as we suspected, I've looked at the film, you do indeed have a kidney stone. Um, it, it's what we call a tweener. And I remember at the time thinking, you know, exactly how many years of medical school <laughs> is required to diagnose a tweener? And he says, well, what I mean by that is he says it's, it's quite large, but it has already begun its journey, so it's kind of in between. And he said, so you've basically got two choices. He said, we could, we could give you a whole bunch of pain meds, send you home, have you drink a lot of fluids. He goes, you might pass it. He said, or as long as you're here, we can just go in up after it. Now... I hadn't worked as a nurse for quite a while at that point, but I still retain a pretty good understanding of fundamental physical anatomy. And when he said, go in up after it, I'm familiar with the root. <laughs> so I said, I tell you what, let's go for a natural birth. <laughs> so they sent me home with a whole bunch of Percocet and, and just told me to take a lot of Percocet and drink a lot of water. It went horribly uh, poorly. It took me 14 days to pass the thing. Everybody always does that, and it's very sweet of you, but I was really a pretty bad patient, too. A lot of it was my fault. But at one point, I was still single then, living alone. I got so loopy on the Percocet, I thought, I can't be alone. So I went out and stayed with my parents. And this is just a quick little scene of how things went out there. <laughs> so I spent the week at my parents' farmhouse in Wisconsin. Now and then the pain would outdistance the Percocet, and I'd try anything, hot baths, microwaved hot packs, incessant pacing, to distract myself until the drugs caught up. Once, I was crawling out of the bathtub when I was swept with nausea. I scrambled for the toilet. Here in the scuffle, 
my mom burst in to check on me. And so it was that at the age of 37, I found myself buck naked on all fours, head in the toilet, puking at the feet of dear old mom. <laughs> She's been a nurse for 40 years and was unfazed, but a guy hopes for a little dignity. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to skip ahead now uh, to what I refer to as the glorious conclusion. Uh, but before I do that, there are just two bits of background information I have to give you so that the ending makes sense. And the first is that when you have a kidney stone, they want you to catch the kidney stone and keep it. And then you bring it back in and they crush it and they analyze it and then based on the chemical composition, they give you dietary recommendations, which you then ignore. <laughs> So in order to accomplish this, when they send you home from the hospital, they give you a little plastic funnel. And in the bottom of the funnel is a screen. And there's really no delicate way to put this. You have to pee through the funnel, every time, everywhere. And that's a problem because, as I wrote in the piece, you really can't stand at a urinal in the farm and fleet <laughs> I don't really have to read the rest, do I? <laughs> the other thing that you need to know uh, so that the ending makes sense is that my urologist, which is a phrase, frankly, I never anticipated uttering, um, he's a smart guy. I like that in a urologist. Uh, but there's no getting around it. He's a geek. He's this kind of tall, slender fellow, big glasses, and geekiest of all, he gets really, really excited about your kidney stone, <laughs> to the point where it leaves you feeling a little bit uncomfortable. So I went in for my first appointment. I sit down, the RN comes in, she takes my health history and vital signs, and then she says, the doctor will be with you shortly. Sure enough, in he comes and he looks at my chart. Then he sits down in his chair and he scoots up knee to knee with me. He goes, okay, kidney stone. Now, a kidney stone is not just a kidney stone. There are actually 19 variations of kidney stones, at which point I said, yeah, well, I've got the one that hurts. <laughs> he then proceeds to go on and describe all of the variations of kidney stones, their size, their shape, their point of origin, chemical composition, all these things. He gets to the end of his five-minute disquisition on the 19 variations of kidney stones, and then he scoots forward in his chair a little more, and he says, and, and, last year at the American Association of Urologists Convention, they announced the discovery of a 20th variation. <laughs> and I said, well, man, that had to be the talk of the convention. I don't know how you guys got anything done after that exciting news. <laughs> so you just have to know uh, in the end here that he gets, he's a geek for renal calculi. <laughs> this is the personal part. <laughs> I was caught completely off guard when it finally happened. I was visiting friends. We were leaving to see a band, and I had run upstairs for a quick, filtered pee. <laughs> Urinating through a sifter was second nature by now, and my mind was somewhere else when, boring, there was a sudden rubbery back pressure, my urine flow stopped dead, my bladder expanded, then clack, and I was peeing effortlessly again. You know how sometimes, if you turn the faucet off too quick, the pipes rattle? <laughs> Firefighters have a term for that. It's called water hammer. When that kidney stone hit the home stretch, I had my own little water hammer moment. And now there it was. Dark brown, rock hard, and the size of a choke cherry pit. I had a sudden urge to call friends. <laughs> and hand out cigars. <laughs> I went to my follow-up appointment. 
No sooner had he closed the examining room door than Dr. Renzepis turned to me eagerly. Did you bring it? <laughs> it's like in third grade when Vinny Bosco wondered if you brought the fart cushion. <laughs> I pulled the specimen bottle from my pocket and held it up to view. The stone rattled against the plastic. Dr. Renzepis' eyes widened. Oh my God. Can I tell you what pride? <laughs> it gives a man to produce an object in this manner and have a board certified urologist say, oh my God. <laughs> I averted my eyes and flushed with awe, shucks, pride. <laughs> Just as quickly I drew back, I bet you tell all your patients that. <laughs> oh no, he said, that, that, that really is a big one. Stones of that size, we usually have to go in after them. I was glowing. <laughs> Thank you. Get some questions going and loosen you up a little bit here. So, <laughs> not so formal now. But, um, so yeah, I think they're going to be handing up questions. So if you have them, but I do have one here that was uh, given to me even before this all started, and we were talking about uh, immersion writing. So I am a fellow writer and about to embark on my first immersion writing project. Could you talk about how to balance? your personal story versus the story or theme of your books. Um, for example, Population 45 or Truck. Well, <clears throat> that's about a five hour course <laughs> is what that is. So first of all, for the sake of immersion, one advantage I had with writing Population 45 is that I wasn't just parachuting in for two weeks or two months and then writing about being a firefighter. I was actually, I'd been an EMT for years before I wrote that book um, and I had been a firefighter for about four or five years before I wrote that book. So I was already doing it before I ever uh, anticipated uh, writing a book about it. So the immersion was very natural, which I think uh, helped. And also nobody, including myself, knew I was writing a book about the experience until I'd been doing it for quite a while. Um, as far as how much of your own experience do you put in? That's such a tricky question because memoir obviously is about yourself um, but you can pretty quickly go over the line and people will get tired of you. I remember a writer named Darcy Frey. Uh, he wrote a, a New York Times Magazine article called Pushing Tin which was about air traffic controllers. It became a, a, a movie. Uh, he also wrote a, a, a book about an NBA star. I think Stefan Marbury. I'm not 100% sure. But I heard him talk one time about you know, using the first person, and he just said, you can use the word I, but it had better be a transparent I. In other words, if you're going to use your own, uh, use yourself, uh, you'd, there better be a good reason, and, and it better ex expand the rest of the story. I, I like that advice uh, because it's succinct and to the point and so nebul nebulous you can make it mean whatever you want. <laughs> so it really is tricky um, to decide how much of yourself to put in to memoir and I don't always get it right and sometimes people send you emails and let you know what you could have done differently. Um, but I think as long as you're, one thing I always try to do, when, I remember when I was writing Population 45, I don't use a lot of tricks because I just need to get the work done, but one day when I would sit down to write I would have a longtime resident of New Auburn and a longtime volunteer firefighter, imaginary uh, person sitting on my shoulder reading everything I wrote and I wanted to know if that person, did, he, did I get it right? Did, was I accurate? Did I capture the way we talk? Then the next day I wanted to have someone from Manhattan on my shoulder. If I'm writing about chicken f barbecues uh, at a fire department garage in rural Wisconsin, am I doing it in such a way that it will hold the interest of someone from Manhattan? And also even firefighting and non-firefighting. One day I would 
pretend that I had a veteran firefighter on my shoulder when I wrote about uh, flashover and backdraft and Halligans and water hammer, um, would that firefighter uh, come to me and say, yep, you got it right. On the flip side, I wanted to make sure that if I wrote about Halligans and water hammer, I wrote about it in such a way that someone who had never been within 100 feet of a firehouse would know what I was talking about. So I hope that speaks to it a little bit. I think ultimately you just have to, you know, here's the bottom line. <laughs> Long before I ever knew I wanted to be a writer, I was in nursing school and I took a creative writing course and I had a really, the, the guy who taught it was so tough and I loved that class even though I had no idea of ever being a writer and wound up there by accident. Um, I wasn't even thinking about writing, I just wound up in there, but I loved what we did and he used to say, some poor person wrote a poem about their grandma dying and he said, I don't care that your grandma died and everyone went, <gasps> and he said, everybody's grandma dies. You have to make me care about your grandma. And, and what sounds very harsh is actually very, very true. You have to find a way to take your individual story and make it speak to a wider audience. Did you receive a response from Grand Dragon Wayne? I never heard from Grand Dragon Wayne and it's probably better that way. Uh, in, I have an essay in uh, Off Main Street. Was it called Letter from the Ku Klux Klan? Was that it? I think so. I, it's been a while. Um, yeah, I just, I just went to the mailbox one day and I had a letter from the Grand Dragon Wayne inviting me to come to one of their functions. And it was handwritten and hand addressed. And I think the reason, just to be t a tiny bit serious, I think he had probably, I had been writing essays about monster trucks and deer hunting and I think he sort of made an assumption about what kind of person I was and so he invited me and so I used his invitation to write um, one of the more heartfelt essays I've ever written about what I thought of him and his little party. <laughs> a couple of questions here that kind of get at the same thing. So how do you balance all the hats you wear, musician, writer, etc., with your family life? And then, so how many hours per week do you actually spend writing? Well, I write every day, but it, because I have to. I'm, I'm completely freelance, so I don't have a steady gig anywhere. I work for whoever will buy my writing. And so uh, the way I put it, um, my muse is a little bald-headed guy named Jim. He sits in a swivel chair nine miles up the road from me at the Chatech State Bank, and he holds my mortgage. <laughs> and if I don't write another book, he takes my house away. <laughs> so it's a symbiotic relationship. And I say that to be funny, but I did make a decision a long time ago to try and just survive on, on what I could write and, and produce. And so, so far we've been able to do it. And part of the reason was that for the first 10 years, I was a single guy living in the middle of nowhere. People say, what's the secret? And I say, man, low overhead, that's the secret. <laughs> Um, and then by the time I met my wife and took on a family and those responsibilities, it's still, it's year to year, but I at least have a sense of what I'm up to and I can see trouble coming about six months out and try to do something about it. And as far as why I do so many different things, at the, at the heart of it all, I never forget my first, I, I can't believe it, but, but every morning when I wake up, the very first thing I want to do is write. I love to write and I love poetry and I love the music of language. I love what Dylan Thomas said about choosing words for their taste over their meaning. And I just, I love that, but I also decided a long time ago I wanted to do that every day and make a living at it. And so part of the, the speaking I do, and I do a lot of one-man monologues at little theaters and I have a band and I write all the music and songs for the band and sing them. And part of that is it's all a way to survive in an age that is very tumultuous. Publishing is changing daily. We all know the story. It's in the digitization of everything. And rather than worry about it, I just want to navigate it. And part of navigating it is finding a way to, I suppose you call it, diversify. But at the heart of it is the writing. If I don't pay attention to the writing, if I don't take the time every day to take that seriously, everything else goes away. I'm under no illusions. The first people who ever came to see me and my band came because they read one of my books, not because they thought I would have anything revolutionary to say with a guitar and three chords. <laughs> All right, you're from Wisconsin, we're in Iowa. Uh, this person asks, which do you find more interesting, poultry or pigs, and why? <laughs> Get deep for a second. Uh, pigs. <laughs> I mean, 
chickens are just pigs with feathers. <laughs> um, did you, uh, difficulty getting your first book published. What got you over the hump? Um, I have a very odd story there because what I did is um, when I started writing, I didn't know anything. I had no idea what I was doing. I was working as a nurse. I started to dabble. I was writing some pretty bad poetry, and, and you know, I'd written a few things here and there, and I wrote a lot of nursing papers, some really long, nasty nursing papers. And I had noticed that I would struggle with my multiple-choice nursing tests and my chemistry tests, but I would just, I would write essay questions and nursing papers, they'd have to beg me to stop. And so when I got out, and I was working as a nurse, and happily so, I was working on a rehab unit, taking care of people who had closed head injuries, traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, quadriplegia, that sort of thing. Um, but I started to get uh, interested in writing, and then I had a friend who sold, she wrote an article about canoeing on a Wisconsin river and sold it to a magazine, and, and she said she got $75. And I said, well, I didn't know you could get paid to write. So I went to the library, and I checked out a copy of the Writer's Market. And in the front of the Writer's Market, there was a section that basically was how to be a writer. And I read it, and I said, oh, okay. Well, I'll do that then. And it sounds goofy, but it really was true. I just started figuring out, you know, how do you pitch things? How do you write query letters? How do you approach this? But the other thing that I also did was I, I quit my nursing job and I took a minimum wage gig where I could put in my eight hours and then come home and shut uh, that part of my life off, which I, as a young nurse, I felt uh, that I couldn't just dabble. I had to take my responsibilities to my patients very seriously. So I took that other job and I thought, well, I'll just try this for a little while and see what happens. And I would come home every night and just write and write and write. And that's what I did for years. And I, I wrote anything and everything. I wrote, I wrote scripts for used car radio ads, I wrote brochures, I wrote speeches for the local hospital CEO, I wrote 300 word pieces for the local business newsletter, anything just to get chops, just to get clips. And then I started putting, th you know, contributing things to local newspapers and from their regional magazines. And I was, in, I, I managed to claw my way into the New York Times Magazine and Esquire and GQ well, with no agent, living in Chippewa County, Wisconsin, just by dint of perseverance, or to put it another way, being too dumb to know when to quit. And so what happened is, in the meantime, every time I published an article or an essay, whether it was in just a little local magazine or if it was in something a little bigger, the one thing I did know from reading the writer's market that I got from the library was keep your rights. And I would always keep the rights to all my stuff. And so... Every couple of years, I would accumulate enough of those to self-publish a book of my own essays. And so I self-published four books of my own work. Uh, the first two, the very first one was horrific, um, and I encourage people to, to look for it and find it, and if you can get a hold of it, please send it to me so that I can be the one to burn it. Um, <laughs> the second one was a little better, but still not worthy. And then the last two weren't bad. As a matter of fact, I still make them available. Uh, but what happened is, by virtue of self-publishing, I learned all these things. I learned about ISBN numbers. I learned about bookstores, how they work, and whether or not, you know, how, what it takes to get on the shelves and get shelf placement. And I just learned how hard it was to get people to see your work. I set up uh, folding card tables in, at craft shows and in gift shops and, and in the mall and would just hand sell my book. And every person that stopped and took one of my books, I got their name on a mailing list. And what happened then is after about 10 years of that, I'm, I'm surviving and I'm getting into some of the bigger magazines living in rural Wisconsin. And some agent in New York City read an essay that I wrote and tracked me down in New Auburn, Wisconsin. My phone rang, this was pre-Google phone rang and she said, I'm so-and-so from this agency in New York City and I wondered if you have any representation. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so then I had an agent and things didn't change overnight. There was still, we had one big false start with a book, which turned out to be the best thing that ever happened. I probably don't have time for the story, but I had a book all ready to go and it got killed at the last moment, which then in the meantime, I had written an essay for Esquire, 
about being a volunteer firefighter in a rural area, and I had written another essay for Salon.com about being an EMT in a rural area, and the agent had seen those two, and when this first book idea died, she said, well, could you write a book about being a volunteer firefighter and EMT? And I said, yep, because <laughs> there's no other answer. And <laughs> So then that led to Population 485. And uh, you know, looking back, I'm so glad that first book didn't make it because I don't think we'd be having this talk. Population 485 surprised all of us. It's never been on the New York Times bestseller list or anything like that, but it has had this sustained, broad life that just we just completely were unprepared for how it was received. So I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> You answered it, I think. That's good. Um, I kind of go off on tangents. I have, I have what I call a barely functional ADD. And <laughs> it, like when I write, it's really hard because I can't keep anything in my head. It, everything shoots off in different directions. I'm constantly going off on tangents. And if you've ever read any of my books, you know this. And <laughs> not everyone likes it. And sometimes they send me emails. But... It just, even when I write, I have to print everything out and I cut it up with the scissors and I move it around by hand. I cut, you know, I'll cut it up and lay it out on the floor or a table. I call it, it's my game of desperate literary solitaire. <laughs> and, and then when I get closer to final drafts, if it's an essay or a chapter, I tape them end to end like a Kerouac roll and I stand over them and read them while I'm walking backwards so that it never breaks. And I just, that's the way I have to work because I'm so scattered. So I gave this talk one time that at a writer's conference. They asked me to describe my writing process. And so I talked about that. Yeah, that's exactly. And so, um, and I made that little quip where I said, yeah, I've got functional ADD. And I thought I was be made it clear I was speaking lightly and humorously, but unbeknownst to me in the audience that day was a clinical psychologist. <laughs> And the next day, I received a very specific email from her, and she said, I listened to you describe uh, the way your, your brain works. You do not have ADD. The symptoms you describe are consistent with flight of ideas, which is associated with a completely different manic depressive disorder. <laughs> I thought, well, you know, whatever it takes. And, and furthermore, as a guy who's been buying his own health insurance since 1992, I thought, you know what? I got diagnosed for free. <laughs> nice. Well, I want to give time for everybody to uh, get the books and sign them too, but I've I got to ask two, two things here at least. One is... Has your family declared anything off limits for you to write about? <laughs> no, they haven't. Um, <clears throat> but I'm careful about that. And uh, this would probably be the closest to a serious answer I get. But obviously my wife and children never asked for any of this. I was doing this before I met them. And so I have learned. My wife hasn't, hasn't read any of my books, um, which is part of the reason I was attracted to her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she came to this thing at the library because her friends made her go and she, afterwards when she finally emailed she emailed me she said I don't know anything I haven't read your books I don't and she said and I don't know if you're anything like the guy I saw talking and that really meant a lot to me because that was that was I wanted to hear that because she was absolutely right I write from the heart I try to I, you know I write nonfiction. I try to lay it out there as honestly as I can but let's you know obviously it's edited it's cleaned up it's it's a slice and so uh, but I have learned um, she reads she's read some of my stuff I have learned to let her read the parts about her um, before they go to print um, <laughs> And I'm pretty tough. I mean, I don't let people change things to make themselves look better, but I do, if someone objects that I haven't gotten something right, I do my best to correct it. And as far as my children, I've written about them, but uh, I love to read Calvin Trillin, and he had a wife and two daughters, and he wrote about them all the time. And one night I was reading one of his essays, and he said, when my daughters turned teenager, I promised them I wouldn't write about them till they are out of college, because no one deserves to have their father writing about them during those difficult years. And I've taken that uh, for my own. I, I don't think I will be quite as, I won't draw as quite a bright line as he has. I probably will write some, but I'm being a little more careful right now because it is a, a tough time. But no, mostly. And I've written, you know, in, in, in I, my brother has been through two unthinkable tragedies. And both of them occurred 
while I was in the process of writing a book, there was no way we could anticipate them happening, and there was also no way to ignore them in the narrative of the book. And in both cases, uh, the first case specifically, I did ask his permission to write about, um, he was married for seven weeks and his wife was killed in a horrific car accident and he was on the fire department with me and he was the first on scene and found her. And so uh, I asked his permission and he sat there very quietly and then he said, because it was what the book was about. And I had already written the last chapter of Population 45. I was done with that part of the book, but I realized that what he went through was what that whole book was about. And I asked him, and he sat there quietly, and then he said, well, you're my, bro you're my brother. I trust you. Uh, you can go ahead and write about it, but I don't ever want to read it. And so I wrote about it. Um, and then a year later, I got from a man who I, has probably read five books, and, and very seldom speaks, let, let alone writes. So I got a note from him, and he just said, I read that book. And he said, that last chapter was hard going, but you honored my wife, and I thank you. And I read that note twice and put it away, and maybe 15 years from now, I'll look at it again, so. That's great. Um, and then, what about this rough take on French philosophy? Oh, well, so I have three books in process. I'm currently finished. young adult fiction, uh, a novel, um, and then after that I've got, I've signed a contract to write my first novel, and then when that's done next January, <laughs> then I will, uh, I will commence my next nonfiction, which is a kind of a memoir, but it focuses on, on the French philosopher and essayist Montaigne, and I'm trying to put him in barn boots, is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> we'll see. 